The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have to hand the bill as amended at Stage 2, that is Scottish Parliament Bill 6A, the marshalled list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should request, sorry, press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. If everyone could settle down, please. We move to Group 1, Poverty and Inequality Commission. And I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 28 to 39. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 4 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be able to bring this important bill to the Chamber for its Stage 3 debate. The bill has had cross-party support for its principles throughout this process and the robust scrutiny of Parliament has led to a number of amendments to strengthen the bill. That is why I committed at Stage 2 to work with members and with stakeholders on amendments that they wish to see. The first of those amendments we come to now. It was clear that people wanted to find a workable solution to ensure that the Poverty and Inequality Commission that this government established had a statutory footing, but also, crucially, retained our vision of being wide in scope. And I am pleased to be able to confirm today to Parliament that following a number of very helpful discussions with stakeholders, including Douglas Hamilton, the current chair of the Commission, Oxfam Scotland, Poverty Alliance and the Child Poverty Action Group and indeed members of this Parliament that have identified a pragmatic and workable solution. My amendments in this group give effect to that solution and strengthen and tidy up provisions related to the Commission where necessary. Amendment 38 lists the Poverty and Inequality Commission in Schedule 5 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. This will allow the Scottish Government to bring forward a public services reform order ensuring the functions of the Commission established in the Bill are wider in scope and reflect the clear wishes of the committee and stakeholders. And I am pleased to inform the Chamber that a draft PSR order has been laid in Parliament today setting out more detail uh, for consultation. Amendment 29 will mean that the provisions establishing the Statutory Commission come into force on the 1st of July 2019. This effectively means that the Statutory Commission will come into operation seamlessly from when the current non-statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission finishes. This ensures the current Commission is able to proceed on the basis set out in the position paper I published earlier this year and will ensure that Ministers receive the Commission's advice on the first delivery plan and on the matters to be included in the first progress report. It also ensures that there will be no break uh, as the Commission moves on to a statutory footing. Amendment 28 states that before the provisions establishing the Statutory Commission come into force, the references in the Bill requiring Ministers to consult the Statutory Commission in relation to the First Delivery Plan and the First Progress Report are to be read as references requiring Ministers uh, to consult the Non-Statutory Commission. The remaining amendments in this group are changes of a more technical nature. Amendments 30, 32, 33 and 35 are drafting amendments replacing incorrect references to subparagraphs with reference to paragraphs. Amendment 31 responds directly to a recommendation of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The report recommended that the delegated power conferred by paragraph 32C of the schedule, which is a power allowing the Scottish ministers by regulations to add it to the list of people in relation to which the Commission has rights of access to information and assistance or explanation that that is subject to the affirmative rather than the negative procedure. And I'm happy to confirm, presiding officer, uh, that we propose uh, to make that change today from negative to affirmative procedure. 
Amendment 34 clarifies that reappointments to the Commission are subject to the same parliamentary approval mechanisms as appointments. Amendment 36 clarifies that the remuneration and expenses mentioned in the schedule are to be paid by Scottish ministers. Amendment 37 is a tidying amendment also, confirming that as well as regulating its own procedures, the Commission may also regulate the procedures of any committees it establishes. Amendment 39 is a technical amendment, adding to the long title of the bill to reflect the fact that the bill now contains provisions establishing a Poverty and Inequality Commission. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to propose these amendments to members today and I hope that members can support them uh, to allow us to move forward together on the basis that I have set out. Thank you and I move amendment four. Call Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm glad that the Cabinet Secretary recognised in her remarks a few moments ago that all of the amendments that we supported and pressed and made at stage two of this bill were amendments designed to strengthen the bill. Um, it's important, Deputy Presiding Officer, that there is a statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission. Um, while I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has already appointed an ad hoc commission that is um, appointed by and directly accountable to her, it's important, I think, that this Parliament says that we want a statutory uh, Poverty and Inequality Commission that is accountable to us uh, as MSPs and not merely uh, to the Minister of the Day. So I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's constructive approach to this issue at Stage 3, and I thank her for it. And the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting all of the amendments in this group. I call Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we will be supporting all the government amendments today, and I think it is a big achievement uh, that the Parliament, hopefully tonight, will be supporting an independent statutory poverty and inequality commission. As Adam Tomkin said, I think those of us at stage two who felt that it was important that the commission was statutory, uh, primarily because we need a commission that also goes beyond the terms of this Parliament and ensures that there is scrutiny over child poverty targets at whichever government is in power. Free and frank expert advice to ministers is essentially uh, important to meet these targets by 2030. Um, a commission that has its own work programme, working with the Children's Commission and the Equality and Human Rights Commission is absolutely vital. And I'd like to welcome the appointment of Douglas Hamilton, chair of the current um, commission and all the other appointments. Um, I would also like to, um, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, to thank Alison Johnson, Adam Tompkins and Richard Leonard who stood firm at stage two to ensure that we got something at this stage which uh, was statutory and independent. I would also like to thank the constructive way in which the Scottish Government has worked through this. And to be honest, in the summer, I wondered if we'd, we'd ever actually get here. Um, but I think a very clever mechanism in this legislation using the Public Services Reform Act has brought us to a place that everybody um, would like to be. And of course, uh, to mention the important work of the third sector in bringing us here to this important uh, part of stage three. Thank you. Call Sandra White. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I just echo my colleagues and, and echo the Cabinet Secretary also? I think the way the committee and the government have conducted themselves over this particular issue has been exemplar and it shows just how much work, if we all work together, what can be provided from uh, committees. I think it's also important to realise that the, the new commission, uh, the Poverty and Equality Commission, will have far-reaching powers and it's not just singular looking at... Uh, poverty of the child poverty is at the moment it'll be much bigger than that and have a bigger remit and for that I'm very grateful thank you presiding officer I'd invite the cabinet secretary to wind up thank you very much presiding officer I very much appreciate the comments and support from members across the chamber uh, as a government we were always committed to an independent poverty and inequality commission it was a key manifesto commitment. It was action three in our Fairer Scotland action plan. And we delivered uh, the Poverty and Inequality uh, Commission on the 3rd of July, as announced by the First Minister. 
We had a very uh, useful and detailed debate about the added value of having a statutory uh, independent commission. Uh, we all agreed that, you know, post stage two, uh, we needed to find a solution to ensure that the Poverty and Inequality Commission had that broad base and wasn't narrowly focused uh, on the, the remit of this bill. So I'm pleased to say that we've found a pragmatic uh, and workable uh, solution. So thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 4 is therefore agreed. We move on to Group 2, the Delivery Plan. And I call Amendment 40 in the name of Alison Johnson. Amendment 40 is grouped with amendments shown on the groupings. I would draw your attention to the preemption information which is also noted on the grouping sheets. Alison Johnson, please to move Amendment 40 and speak to all other amendments in the group. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The anti-poverty measures we'll need to put in place to stand any hope of achieving the targets will need to be radical and far-reaching. They will also need to be adequately funded. We know from previous experience, particularly New Labour's progress in reducing child poverty, that this doesn't come cheap. And though they could always have done more, those governments made significant investment in more generous social security benefits for families, as well as in education, children's health and other areas. And as we go forward into the production of the delivery plans, we need to be very clear about what level of investment will be made by Scottish governments as part of those plans. And that is what my Amendment 40 does. It requires Scottish governments to include in those plans an assessment of the financial resources required to fund the delivery plan measures. Amendment 42 is designed to ensure that the requirement that Scottish governments regularly consider topping up child benefit that was inserted at stage two remains in the final version of the bill. It is the case that in no way does the amendment force the Scottish government to exercise the power to top up child benefit. All it does is to require the government to indicate in each delivery plan whether it intends to use those powers. If it decided not to, it would be free not to do so but it is an idea we should consider seriously if we're to make progress towards the targets the bill sets. There's good evidence to suggest that a five pound top up to child benefit would make immediate inroads to child poverty. Research by the University of York suggests that it could help 30,000 children escape relative child poverty. And I don't think any other anti-poverty measure we've discussed in the course of the bill's passage is likely to achieve such large reductions in poverty so quickly. Organisations including Child Poverty Action Group Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, Children in Scotland, Children First, Scottish Women's Convention, the Children and Young Persons Commissioner Scotland, the Church of Scotland, the Comforti Institute and Justice and Peace Scotland, to name just some, are all calling for such a policy. And a top up to child benefit couldn't come a moment too soon. The Child Poverty Action Group projects that by 2020, this benefit will have lost 28% of the value it had in 2010. And we can start to address that by adding on an extra five pound. We know that this benefit goes to more of its intended recipients um, than is the case for almost any other benefit apart from the state pension, with 95% of those who are eligible for child benefit making a successful claim. Now, I accept that the near universality of child benefit means that some of the additional spending would go to relatively well-off families whose children aren't in poverty, but there are a range of problems with having a means-tested approach, not least because the take-up for means-tested benefits is lower. And I would also add that many food banks report that child benefit is often the only source of income for families that present to them, for whom means-tested benefits and the system that delivers them have failed due to sanctions and administrative errors. The Scottish Government describes Social Security as an investment, and I agree wholeheartedly with that approach. And at a cost of around £250 million annually, a £5 top-up would be a significant investment. However, Loughborough University conservatively estimates that child poverty costs us £750 million a year. That's an investment we can't afford not to make. It is something we should regularly consider doing, and that is what my amendment does. I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 5 and other amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I will speak to my own amendments in this group and respond to the amendments of Alison Johnston, Adam Tompkins and Pauline McNeill. The amendments in this group relate to Section 7 and the contents of the child poverty delivery plans that Scottish ministers will be required to develop and publish. 
As members will be aware, a number of amendments to this section were agreed at stage two. As there were multiple changes, the result is that section seven, as amended, is repetitive and difficult to interpret. I wrote to the Social Security Committee last week explaining my approach to Section 7 and giving a detailed explanation of the amendments I propose to bring forward. As I explained in that letter, my intention is to streamline the provisions, removing the repetition and duplication and ensuring the ordering is clear. These amendments ensure anyone reading the legislation can see clearly what they should expect from the Scottish Government in terms of producing a delivery plan. My amendments keep to the spirit of what was wanted from stage two and strengthen the bill even further. Amendment five introduces the subsection which lists the subject areas ministers must cover in a delivery plan. It requires ministers to set out measures they propose to take in relation to all lists of matters. In the main, these are matters already listed in subsection, but amendment six consolidates and relocates the references to social security powers. References to the use of social security powers were the subject of the most duplication in the post stage two version of the bill and I have sought to remove that and other duplication via amendments 10 and 11. In seeking to improve this subsection of the bill I have paid attention to the clear desire from stakeholders and members for an explicit reference to the use of social security powers. The full range of Scotland Act 2016 powers have therefore been explicitly highlighted in Amendment 6. This broader reference covers the power to top up specific benefits, including child benefit, child tax credit and universal credit, and therefore makes more sense in terms of future proofing, leaving open the range of options that ministers might consider in future. And this leads me, President Officer, to respond to Alison Johnston's Amendment 42 and Pauline McNeill's Amendment 43. For the reasons that I have just outlined, I believe that Amendment 6 addresses the points that Ms Johnston and Ms McNeill make, and their amendments, in my view, are therefore unnecessary. However, in the interest of continuing the cooperative cross-party approach we have had during this bill, the Scottish Government will not oppose these amendments. Amendment 7 replaces the reference to employment that pays the Scottish living wage with a wider reference to the nature and quality of employment. That is employment with remuneration that is sufficient to ensure an adequate standard of living. Clearly the nature and quality of employment is about more than just hourly pay rates, important though those are. And as this is Living Wage Week, we will be even more aware of the importance of the living wage. But by itself, it does not guarantee a decent income. For example, you can of course be in receipt of a living wage, but on a zero hours or part-time contract, so not in receipt of an adequate income. I note that this amendment preempts Pauline McNeill's Amendment 1, which seeks to specifically highlight single parent households in the context of employment and skills. My Amendment 8 does something similar, requiring Scottish ministers to set out in a delivery plan. Um, could you just give me a moment, please, to complete a sentence, uh, just so we're clear for the record. My Amendment 8 does something similar, requiring Scottish ministers to set out in a delivery plan any measures that they intend to take in relation to single parent households. And I hope that this will satisfy Ms McNeill that she does not need to press her amendment. I uh, give way to Mr Finlay. Neil Finlay. Earlier, the Minister said that the Government wouldn't oppose the amendment. Does that mean they will support the amendment? Uh, yes, Angela Constance. Forgive me, President Officer. Yes, it does, uh, President Officer. My Amendment 9 brings Richard Leonard's text on revenue support grants into the overall list of delivery plan measures that ministers must set out in line with the overall approach of consolidating uh, all of the requirements into one place. I signal my intention to bring forward Amendment 12 at Stage 2. It clarifies the amendment brought forward by Ben McPherson that there should be a requirement for Scottish ministers to make a statement to the Parliament in relation to each delivery plan. Amendment 13 is a tidying amendment confirming that the requirement to consult various groups on the development of the delivery plan can be complied with before the Act comes into force. This is to reflect the fact that the Scottish Government is already undertaking a programme of consultation on the delivery plan 
and that there wouldn't be sufficient time to undertake detailed consultation if we wait until after the bill receives royal assent. I hope that members will recognise that these amendments need to be considered together in order for the legislation to be coherent, easy to understand and interpret. As a whole, my amendments are a practical way of achieving what members intended at stage two and make section seven a stronger, clearer piece of legislation. I will now turn to Adam Tompkins amendments two and three in relation to educational attainment. Scottish Government is absolutely committed to tackling the attainment gap and would of course expect to be addressing educational attainment as part of the first delivery plan. And for that reason, I am content to support Mr Tompkins amendment two. However, President Officer, I cannot support his amendment three. As members are aware, the Scottish Government is currently carrying out a public consultation on the approach to measuring progress on closing the attainment gap. We want to have a clear way of measuring progress and just as we do now, we want to use several measures to do so. Our consultation proposes an approach that could be used to assess progress in literacy, numeracy and health and wellbeing and also seek the views on key milestones for closing the gap between those from the most and least disadvantaged backgrounds. That consultation will close on the 20th of November and the Scottish Government plans to use the findings in our approach to measure the gap within the 2018 Education Improvement Plan, which will be published in December. To allow for that consultation to be the right and proper approach to measuring the attainment gap, rather than through the Child Poverty Bill, I would respectfully urge Mr Tompkins to withdraw this amendment. Finally, President Officer, I can confirm that I will support Alison Johnson's Amendment 40. I will, of course, be carefully considering the allocation of resources for measures set out in the delivery plan, and I am happy to set out in the plan an assessment of what financial resources are required. Thank you. I call Adam Tompkins to speak to Amendment 2 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, the these amendments are all about, the group, this group of amendments is all about delivery plans. And delivery plans, as the Cabinet Secretary said, will be absolutely central to the success uh, of this bill. Section 7, when the bill was introduced, was, I think it would be fair to describe as skeletal. It didn't say anything very much at all about what must be in a delivery plan. And this is one of those elements of the bill that was significantly um, uh, strengthened at stage 2 with uh, cross-party uh, support that Pauline McNeill referred to uh, earlier on. And Section 7 is in much stronger form now than it was when the bill was introduced. We will be supporting all of the government amendments uh, here in this group uh, on Section 7, which, as the Cabinet Secretary just explained, are designed to tidy up what were, when they were all read together, uh, somewhat um, repetitive amendments made uh, at Stage 2. I think, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's very important to note the holistic approach to child poverty that these delivery plans will have to take. We know that the targets uh, in section one of the bill are narrowly and carefully focused on income alone. But I think we also all know that you cannot successfully tackle child poverty by thinking about income alone. You do also need to think about education and you do also need to think about the employment prospects of families and parents and guardians. And you do also need to think about the range of other issues that the cabinet secretary and Alison Johnson uh, have uh, talked about. And that's why we welcome that more broad brush, that more holistic, that more um, uh, universal approach um, to uh, a, uh, an anti-poverty strategy that uh, is now um, uh, embraced, I think, by, by a much improved Section 7. Um, I very much welcome the fact that the government is going to support uh, my Amendment 2, which is a modest amendment, which simply adds uh, to uh, the uh, re requirement already in Section 7 that delivery plans must address themselves to education, to focus minds specifically on reducing the attainment gap, which the Cabinet Secretary and the First Minister have spoken about uh, so powerfully uh, during the lifetime of this uh, Parliament. Uh, and in the light of what the Cabinet Secretary has said about my amendment number three, which was just des designed to try and define attainment gap, so we didn't have the term on the statute book without it being defined, I'm very happy to withdraw that amendment, Deputy Presiding Officer, and not to press it uh, on this occasion. Although I'm sure as a Parliament we will want to revisit exactly what it is that Scottish Ministers are doing and are proposing to do to tackle uh, this very important matter of reducing the attainment gap. Um, and finally, uh, in reference to Alison Johnston's um, uh, amendment on top-ups, I agree with what the Cabinet Secretary had to say, uh, that this amendment, I think, is strictly unnecessary. Uh, I think that the government amendments already 
require delivery plans to take into account the full range of devolved social security powers which have been provided for uh, in the Scotland Act 2016, but there is no harm in some repetition uh, and there is no harm in drawing uh, ministers' minds specifically to the importance of top-up powers. It was the Scottish Conservatives who brought top-up powers to the Smith Commission table, so I'm quite personally attached to the idea that we should take top-up powers seriously as an important part of devolved social security. The Deputy Presiding Officer remembers the Smith Commission very well, as does the chuckling uh, Deputy uh, First Minister. I'm glad to see he's enjoying himself. Um, uh, and, and I think that the, re the reason why we will uh, support um, uh, this amendment as the uh, government is supporting it also is because one of the things that is sometimes said by um, uh, the SNP is that only 15% of social security powers have been devolved. It's not true. It's actually a third of working age social security which has been devolved in full. And in addition to that, we have the top-up power. And in addition to that, we have the power to create no new benefits. So a statutory recognition of the, of the particular importance of the top-up power, uh, which is what Alison Johnston's amendment calls for, is one that we can support. Thank you. Call Pauline McNeill to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, first, I'd like to welcome again the spirit and the constructive way that the government have uh, acknowledged that there's a significant number of amendments at stage two that ideally they wouldn't um, have planned for. Um, but I think it's fair to say that at stage three, it is fair that we should try to tidy that up to make sure we have good legislation. I, of course, submitted my amendments before I saw all the government amendments. I'd like to just talk through them now. Um, I raised the issue at stage two, um, a bit specific mention of the need to uh, have um, measures addressed in the delivery plan uh, for lone parents. There's evidence that shows that that group in particular fare worse under, uh, under welfare reform and in relation to child poverty, and that is already uh, in the bill. Uh, for completeness, I had wanted to ensure that where there was references to employability, there was a special reference to lone parents. I would seek not to move Amendment 1, presiding officer, because I think that is now adequately covered by Amendment 7 and the other government amendments in this group. In relation to Amendment 43, I seek not to move that amendment. I think that Amendment 6, which does make specific reference to the use of welfare benefits, um, under the Scotland Act, I think is uh, adequately covered. Um, however, um, I would continue to support the amendment in the name of Alison Johnson in Amendment 42. As Adam Tompkins um, says, the, in the delivery plan, it sets out that ministers should say whether they intend to bring forward legislation and exercise those powers in Section 24 of the Scotland Act, whomsoever is responsible for bringing top-up powers to the Scotland Act. Nonetheless, um, the uh, ministers should be expected to say whether they intend to use it. And the, and the reason behind it is, I, I certainly believe that the, the delivery plan has to mean simply more than measuring child poverty. Um, that I believe that ministers and the government of the day uh, should be setting out quite clearly how they intend to use the resources of the Parliament to reduce child poverty. And it is for that reason that we will also be supporting Amendment 40 in the name of Alison Johnson, because I think it would be helpful to have some assessment of the financial uh, resources that would be proposed by government to deal with child poverty. Um, I've addressed Amendment 6. Amendment 2 in the name of Adam Tompkins. Yes, Adam Tompkins has been consistent in raising the issue of educational attainment. We don't see eye to eye on everything in relation to that because we believe that income should be the primary focus. However, we will be supporting Amendment 2 because there's a special mention of education in the list, in the delivery plan, and I think it's right that it should say that in particular closing the attainment gap. Uh, the reason that we wouldn't support Amendment 7, although we recognise what it's, uh, sorry, Amendment 3 in the name of Adam Tompkins, uh, is because, as members know, there's other work ongoing in trying to define the meaning of uh, um, the educational attainment gap and how, and how to close it. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Call Alison Johnson to wind up and press or withdraw her amendment. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think we would agree that child benefit is a trusted, stigma-free source of income for the vast majority of families. But for so many households, it is an absolute lifeline. Um, obviously, like colleagues, I'm open to discussions about the design and delivery of new benefits. 
and I'm sure we all agree that lifting family incomes should be an absolute priority. I do appreciate the government's desire to continue the cross-party nature of the work that has brought the bill to this point today, and I warmly welcome their support for my amendments. Um, Amendment 42 in particular has been campaigned for, supported by, and will be warmly welcomed by the organisations that I've already mentioned, but also by individuals and families across Scotland. Adam Tompkins, I, I welcome the support of the Conservative benches too. Um, Adam Tompkins suggested that in specifically highlighting this benefit, there was no harm, but I believe that specific mention of this benefit will strengthen the government's amendments and this bill. Thank you. Could you formally well, press I, Amendment Yes, I, I press my amendments. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call amend Amendment 5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 40, and ask the Cabinet Secretary to formally move that amendment. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Cabinet Excuse me, I'll take my glasses off and then I won't get my numbers mixed up. Aha, I call Amendment 6 <laughs> in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 40. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We then move on to Group 3, Equalities. And I call Amendment 41 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Grouped with Amendments 44, 45, 46 and 47. I would ask Jackie Bailey to move Amendment 41 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to move Amendment 41 and, as you suggested, speak to all others in the group. Can I, at the outset, thank the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights for their work on this policy area, and I hope to see this approach adopted by government for future legislation. I also very much welcome the cooperation and partnership working from the Cabinet Secretary, her Special Advisor, and officials. The Cabinet Secretary asked me to withdraw my amendments at stage two, um, which I was happy to do to allow for discussion, and I'm delighted that we've reached agreement on all of the stage three amendments in this group. Purpose of these amendments is to ensure that children with protected characteristics or living in a household where someone has a protected char characteristic are recognized as being most at risk of poverty. Let me cite three UN committees in support of these amendments. Firstly, the UN Committee on Rights of the Child. In 2016, they concluded that the rate of child poverty in the UK remained high and disproportionately affected children with disabilities or children living in households where there was a disabled person and children from ethnic minorities too. In the same year, the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights also noted that poverty was prevalent amongst lone parent families. And this year, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities urged the UK government to eliminate the higher level of poverty among families with children with disabilities. So this is the right thing for us to do. Amendments 41, 45, 46 and 47 embed this approach in the delivery plan, the progress report and the local child poverty reports. We all know that if we don't embed equality in policy from the very start, it becomes an add-on, an afterthought. And whilst I always will welcome equality impact assessments, these aren't always the answer. And let me demonstrate that briefly. The equality impact assessment on, for example, the mental health strategy has no mention of race or ethnic ethnicity, yet we know that there is a differential mental health impact experienced by BME communities. Some equality impact assessments are of variable quality. Some public bodies haven't even bothered to submit them. So it is important that we have something more robust on the face of the bill. And these amendments build equality in from the very start ensure we evaluate progress and insist that local child poverty plans reflect equality too. I think it takes us from warm words and good intentions and gives them the clear hard edge of requiring action. 
Amendment 44 is about consultation, making sure that we talk to all those with an interest and contribution to make something that this Parliament has always sought to do. So, Presiding Officer, let me finish with a quote from the First Minister's independent advisor on poverty in her report called Shifting the Curve, when she talks about those with protected characteristics. These are often the most disadvantaged and have additional barriers to face in escaping poverty. I hope the Chamber doesn't need any more convincing because it is essential that we recognise this if we are to effectively tackle child poverty in Scotland. I urge the Chamber to support these amendments and I move Amendment 41 in my name. Call the Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I welcome Jackie Bailey's commitment to issues around equalities and poverty and I'm pleased that we've been able to work together uh, to develop the amendments she is proposing today. As Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities, I'm keenly aware uh, of my responsibilities in this area and I agree with Jackie Bailey that if we are to tackle poverty, we must consider the impact that having a protected characteristic can have. As Ms Bailey rightly pointed out when we discussed equalities at stage two, it is important for us all to remember that poverty can affect different equality groups in different ways. And therefore, we need to take that into account when developing policies and actions. So I welcome the additional requirements for Scottish ministers to take the impact of protected characteristics on household income and expenditure into account when developing delivery plans and progress reports and for local partners to do the same. I thank Jackie Bailey once again for her constructive engagement on this issue and would urge members to support amendments 41, 44, 45, 46 and 47. May I ask Jackie Bailey to wind up and press or withdraw her amendment? Um, I don't need to add anything more, Presiding Officer. You'll be pleased to hear I intend to press my amendments. The question is, therefore, that Amendment 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 40. Adam Tompkins, to move or not move? Formally moved. The question is, that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 40. Remember that if Amendment 7 is agreed to, uh, that preempts Amendment 1. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is, that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We therefore go straight to Amendment 8, that having been agreed. I call Amendments 8, 9 and 10, all in name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 8 to 10 on block. Moved on block. May I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 8 to 10? The question is that Amendments 8 to 10 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendments 8 to 10 are therefore agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 40, and would ask Adam Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. I therefore call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 40. Cabinet Secretary, would you move that formally, please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 42 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 40. Alison Johnson to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 42 is agreed. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 40. Pauline McNeill, please move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 40. Cabinet Secretary, please formally move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 12 is agreed. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 41. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 44 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. And I call Amendment 13 
in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 40. Cabinet Secretary, please move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. And I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Oh, we're on to a new group. I was rattling through there. <laughs> group 4. We move to Group 4, Progress Reports. And I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 15 to 23 and 27. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 14 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. All of the amendments in this group are in my name and are technical, consequential or drafting amendments. I will highlight a few of the most significant changes for the record. Amendments 14 and 27 move the definition of parent into the interpretation section. Amendment 15 adjusts the existing provision in the bill requiring progress reports to set out progress in reducing the number of children in single parent households who live in poverty. It ensures that a wider category of person is captured. For example, the text as amended at stage two would not include as a single parent, a person who is married but separated, but such a person might not be in receipt of any support from their former partner. Amendment 23 is a tidying amendment, similar to the one that I made in relation to delivery plans. It clarifies that the requirement introduced by Ben McPherson for Scottish ministers to make a statement is a requirement for a statement to this parliament in relation to a progress report. The remainder of the amendments in this group are minor drafting changes. I therefore move Amendment 14 and ask members to support all of the amendments in this group. I've had no requests to speak on this. Would you like to wind up, Cabinet Secretary? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendments therefore agreed. I call Amendment 15 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 14. Cabinet Secretary to move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 41. Jackie Bailey, please move or not move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23. All in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 16 to 23 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 16 to 23? The question is that amendments 16 to 23 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Did I hear a no? Can I ask that again for clarity? Because I heard something wrong. The question is that amendments 16 to 23 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> the amendments are there for... We now move to group five, minor and technical amendments. And I call Amendment 24 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 25 and 26. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 24 and speak to all amendments in the group. Presiding Officer, again, all three of the amendments in this group are in my name and all are minor technical or drafting changes to a subsection in the provision for local child poverty action reports. So I move Amendment 24 and ask members to support all amendments in the group. You do have the opportunity to wind up, Cabinet Secretary. Tempting, but I'll decline. Thank you. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 25 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 24. Cabinet Secretary, please move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 24. Cabinet Secretary, please move formally. Formally moved. 
The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 41. Jackie Bailey, please move or not move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 14. Cabinet Secretary, please move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 41. Jackie Bailey, please move or not move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendments 28 to 39, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 28 to 39 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 28 to 39? The question is that Amendments 28 to 39 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Sounded to me like there was only one person agreed that there. <laughs> are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> we are therefore agreed. That ends consideration of the amendments. The debate will follow this, of course, and I give you a few minutes to change places and get yourself sorted. Uh, thank you. Before we move on to the debate, I'm required to say, as members will be aware at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. Put briefly, that is whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish Parliament elections. If it does, the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members, that is a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision of the Child Poverty Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. And I move on to the next item of business, which is the debate on motion 8696 in the name of Angela Constance on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion. A generous nine minutes, uh, Ms Constance. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very pleased to be opening this Stage 3 debate on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. Uh, the passing of this bill will mark a historic milestone uh, on our road to eradicating child poverty. 
And I want to start by saying that I had a lovely visit this morning to St Catherine's Primary School uh, in the south side of the city of Edinburgh. Uh, and I went there to find out about how their very popular uh, breakfast club is setting children up for the day to enable them to make the most of their learning. And they asked me to wear this uh, wristband, uh, presiding officer. And these wristbands are given to children when they perform well. So I hope this afternoon that I'm going to live up to the expectations uh, of the children of St Catherine's Primary School. As is customary, presiding officer, I would also like to start by thanking everyone who has been involved in developing uh, this important bill. My thanks go to the clerks of the Social Security Committee. I'm grateful to the committee convener, Sandra White, and members who have helped shape the bill and who have been constructive throughout. The fact that this critical legislation has cross-party support and we have worked collaboratively to strengthen this bill is an achievement that we all share. And I'm also grateful to the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their careful consideration of the bill. I would also like to thank the many stakeholders who have supported the bill from responding to our initial consultation to giving evidence or engaging directly with me and my officials. And I have been grateful for their views and their contributions. And although I won't be able to mention them all, I would like to pay particular tribute to the following. The Coalition to End Child Poverty helped to improve the bill in a number of ways. The Scottish Youth Parliament, among others, usefully represented and powerfully represented the views and interests of our young people. And Oxfam Scotland played a valuable role in helping prepare for the introduction of the Poverty and Inequality Commission. And the local reference group, which represents local authorities and health boards, has been developing practical guidance on the local duty. And in particular, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Ministerial Advisory Group on Child Poverty. The group's expertise and guidance has been invaluable in getting us to this point, and their legacy is a strong foundation for the new Poverty and Inequality Commission. The Bill presiding Officer has benefited greatly from the input of committee, and this has led to a number of changes uh, since introduction. First, the range of subjects to be included in the delivery and local action plans has been usefully extended. Second, parliamentary scrutiny has been strengthened and ministers now need to make a statement to parliament when publishing delivery plans and progress reports. And third, a forward-looking aspect to local reports has been agreed, requiring local authorities and health boards to outline the action that they propose to take in future years. Establishing an independent poverty and inequality commission was indeed a manifesto commitment of this government. It appeared as action number three in the Fairer Scotland Action Plan and it was delivered in July this year when Douglas Hamilton was appointed as commission chair and Naomi Eisenstadt and Callie Annie Lyle as deputy chairs. This commission has a remit to advise ministers on child poverty but also crucially on any issue that it sees fit. And I've worked hard to find a solution to the problem identified uh, at stage two that making the Commission a statutory body under this bill would limit its remit so it would only be able to focus on child poverty. So today, as I said earlier, presiding officer, I have introduced a draft order under the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010 to meet Parliament's aspirations for a statutory commission with a wide remit. The order will mean that the existing commission can move on to a statutory footing from July 2019, ensuring that this independent body can advise ministers on the first delivery plan due in April 2018 and the progress report, which is due in June 2019. For me, it's been vital to protect the commission's wide remit. The commission was set up specifically to provide ministers with independent advice on a wide range of poverty and inequality issues facing our country. And child poverty is an obvious first focus, but the Commission will also be able to look at how we should address economic inequality, intergenerational inequality, and the high risk of poverty faced by minority ethnic groups, eh, among other challenges. This is why I've argued strongly to keep that wide focus, because to make progress on these deep-rooted problems that needs 
expert and independent advice. Presiding officer, the bill signals the importance that we as a parliament and as a country place on tackling the unacceptable levels of child poverty across Scotland. In 2015 and 16, one in four children were living in relative poverty after housing costs. And the Scottish Government fundamentally disagreed with the UK Government's decision to remove the targets and associated duties from the Child Poverty Act 2010. And that led to the introduction of this bill, uh, which reintroduces, reintroduces income targets, but with even greater ambition. And the UK Government's new approach, focusing on so-called workless households, ignores the fact of the growing number of families who are in work and at the same time in poverty. Again, in 2015-16, 70% of children in poverty lived in a household where at least one adult uh, was in employment. And the continued cuts to welfare spending, which in Scotland will amount to an annual cut of £4 billion by the end of this decade, are indeed making things much worse. Work used to be a way out of poverty, but for too many, that is no longer the case and rates of pay and the number of hours available just aren't enough to ensure that their children have a bright future. So meeting our ambitious targets to eradicate child poverty uh, by uh, 2030 will indeed be challenging and it will at times feel as if we are fighting with one hand tied behind our backs in the face of those cuts that according to the Child Poverty Action Group will see the biggest increase in child poverty since the 1960s meaning more than 5 million kids across the UK are growing up in poverty. And the Scottish Government is already taking positive action. The programme for government announced £50 million uh, tackling child poverty fund, taking advice from the Commission on where funding can have uh, the biggest impacts. We are introducing the Best Start grant by summer 2019, which will provide cash payments to lower income families and offer uh, increased financial support in those crucial early years. And we will be providing free access to sanitary products in schools, colleges and universities and following a pilot programme in Aberdeen, consider how to support uh, women on low incomes. And we will be providing a financial health check guarantee to make sure that families with children on low incomes claim all that they are entitled to. And we will support Scotland's credit union sector so more people have access to affordable and ethical alternatives to high street banking uh, and payday loans. And this is on top of our existing programme to deliver 50,000 uh, affordable, uh, warm, affordable homes, uh, help to close uh, the poverty-related attainment gap and take the next steps towards the near doubling of funded early learning and childcare and, of course, uh, introduce uh, a new socio-economic duty for the public sector. Presiding officer, we all know that the 2030 targets are highly ambitious and challenging, but poverty is not inevitable. And as we've seen during the passage of this bill, there is a genuine cross-party desire to place these targets in statute and then to take action to meet them. And if everyone plays their part, the targets are indeed achievable and we can transform the prospects of generations to come. This bill is the crucial next step and I move that Parliament agrees the Child Poverty Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call Adam Tompkins to open the Conservative six minutes, Mr Tompkins. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, we very much welcome the all-party agreement that there now is uh, on the Child Poverty Bill, and I agree with much of what the Cabinet Secretary has just had to say. This is an important uh, piece of legislation, um, and the um, tone in which I think it has been debated today is a significant and very welcome change uh, of the tone that it was um, uh, that we had at, at stage two. This bill has had a good passage through Parliament. I still think that the stage one debate that we had in this chamber a few months ago was the single best debate that I've had the privilege of taking part in uh, in this chamber with notable contributions from Alec Neil and from my friend and colleague Jamie Green amongst uh, many others. Um, this was not a very powerful bill when it was introduced into this Parliament. Um, and everything that we've done, indeed I think that everything that all of the opposition parties have done uh, to this bill and with this bill over the course of the last few months mm. has, been done, has been done in order to try and make the bill stronger, to try and strengthen it, to try and make it more robust. This bill contains 
very ambitious targets, um, and it will be difficult to meet them. And I think that the amendments that we've made um, on interim targets, the amendments that we've made on um, the delivery plan that we spoke about uh, um, earlier on this afternoon, and the amendments that we made uh, in terms of putting the Poverty and Inequality Commission on a statutory basis will all help uh, the government and indeed public authorities throughout Scotland to meet uh, those very ambitious uh, targets uh, as best they can. In particular, I welcome uh, the amendments that we made uh, to Section 7 on the de delivery plans. On these benches, we don't believe that you can be effective in your anti-poverty strategy um, if you focus only on income. Of course, you have to focus on income, among other things. But we don't believe that the focus should be solely on income. And I, I very much welcome, we all on these benches very much welcome the fact that in the delivery, in the delivery plans, express reference will now have to be made to education, to the attainment gap, to housing, to the availability and affordability of childcare, to employment and the employment prospects and the skills training of parents and families, uh, as well as to considerations pertaining to health. All of these features are already there in the Scottish Government's child poverty measurement framework and in the child poverty action plan. And it's important, it seems to me, that they are reflected in the bill, soon to be an act. Two, we wanted to go much further, presiding officer. Uh, we wanted um, this bill not merely to measure child poverty, but to take direct steps to tackle uh, and reduce it, particular at source. We wanted there to be a target in addition to the four income related targets on employment. And I noticed that in some of the briefing that we've been sent uh, for today's debate from the third sector, that it said that 30% of children in poverty in Scotland today live in families where no one works. The employment prospects of parents and carers is still a directly relevant and material consideration when you are thinking about child poverty. We wanted there also to be um, a statutory target to take steps to reduce the attainment gap. There is already, of course, a statutory target, or not a statutory target, a statutory duty to have regard uh, to the attainment gap, but that's plainly not enough. The attainment gap at the moment is getting worse, not better. Numeracy levels uh, 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 for children from our most deprived communities are getting worse, not better. The attainment gap is growing not narrowing, international PISA, PISA results so that show that Scottish education is going backwards and England and Northern Ireland now outperform Scotland in every category, as does the Republic of Ireland, Estonia, Poland and many other countries. We wanted the Child Poverty Bill to take direct action to require ministers to address this. At least now the delivery plans have to do that even if there isn't the statutory target uh, that we wanted. This bill is stronger, Deputy Presiding Officer, than it was when it was introduced into this Parliament, uh, and as I've already said, I welcome that. But on its own, and we should be under no illusions about this, this bill will do nothing to lift even a single child in Scotland out of poverty. All of the action now turns to the delivery plans and to the holistic approach which those delivery plans will require ministers to take. So I wish Angela Constance and her ministerial team well in seeking to meet these targets. They are ambitious. It is right that they are ambitious. But today, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Parliament sends to our country a strong and unified message. We are united that these targets should be met. We can make child poverty history in Scotland. So let's get to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Tompkins. Call on Pollock McNeill to open for Labour. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin um, by thanking the committee clerks. Um, can I give a special thanks to Mark Brock and the legislation team, how they followed all the amendments that all of us wanted to achieve. It's quite remarkable, and I'd like to um, mention them particularly. And I think it has to be recognised that, that there's some ingenuity in using the Public Services Reform Act to bring us where we are now, which is to make something which started off as only a commission for child poverty into a wider poverty and inequality commission. So whoever's idea that was, I think in my book, has to be absolutely fully uh, commended for that. 
Um, child poverty bill that sets out the targets to reduce child poverty, relative poverty, absolute poverty, low income material deprivation and of course persistent poverty. As we know, one in four children live in poverty and we have one of the worst records in Europe. So I agree with Adam Tompkins when he says that it is just simply more about measuring levels of poverty, but it is using the powers of this parliament, working with local authorities and taking the relevant measures that can actually make a difference. And the Scottish Government, for its time, and this Parliament will have the full support of the Labour Party to attempt to achieve that. The delivery plan is the main mechanism for setting out government policy and allowing this Parliament to see how government policy will attempt to actually help reduce child poverty. Child poverty is a national scandal in 2017 if you live in a first world economy, which we do. The life chances of hundreds and thousands of children are affected because they live in a very low income household. I know that we all agree that no child should be robbed of their years in childhood because they are too poor. All of us take our own special interests in trying to make a difference. Just two I'd like to mention of my own. Um, I did actually support Adam Tompkins' amendment which, which tries to broaden out just the educational attainment issue. Um, but for me, it's really important that all children get the chance to learn a musical instrument. And I actually think it's very good for children from low-income households. I know a lot of work has been done on this. And I also think it's important that ch all children have parity when it comes to tutoring support and education in order to close. And some work needs done by this parliament and local authorities to make sure that poorer children get the same access to tutors in school as to children from wealthier families. Because 70% of children in poverty, indeed, are actually in working households. Bright but poor children, and that's an awful lot of children, can lag up to two years behind wealthier ones. A toddler in a poor household is two and a half times more likely than a child living in more affluent circumstances to have poorer health. And by the age of five, there can be a gap up to 13 months in their vocabulary. Welfare reforms has deepened this crisis and sadly it will get worse as we debated the report yesterday of the austerity generation and that, that, could, that report could not have come at a more poignant time. I just want to highlight a, a couple of issues in my concluding remarks, presiding officer. I'm pleased at the achievements of um, the stage two of this bill and uh, I think together across party, I think we've made a, a bill that is, that, that is that absolutely worth supporting here tonight. Uh, at the end of the stage three process. Um, I was keen to highlight the issue of lone parents and those with a disability, and I'm pleased that they are now uh, in the bill and have to be addressed by ministers. Um, this morning, I chaired along with Alison Johnson a round table on the automation of benefits, which is in the bill. It is just simply a term for exploring where uh, local authorities who can identify that those who are already eligible for a benefit such as a uh, housing benefit can be cross-matched and uh, establish their eligibility for other certain benefits. The idea behind it is that many don't come forward, they don't fill in the complex forums, and they're asked to jump through hoops and very complex processes. One uh, story that uh, struck me this morning um, was a mum with four children had been claiming um, had been claiming housing benefit, but was unaware that she was eligible for the clothing grant. And through the work that Glasgow Inclusion Financial Inclusion Team has done, across, uh, matching the data of her entitlement, we're able to issue her directly um, a, a voucher for £280 for her four children. Um, she was quite astonished to receive it, and, and she'd phoned up the team to say, are, are you sure that I'm due this because that can't be right? She said, you cannot imagine the difference that this £280 pounds it can make. I don't I think I've got to wind up, presiding officer, at this. I'd like to thank Jean Freeman for the interest that she's taken in this issue. And I, I hope that with the help and support of other members and local authorities in the parliament, we can look at how we can widen out um, the scope of this to maximise eligibility and the benefits for people who need it the most. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a little time in hand. And so I say to those in the open debate, up to, key up to, five minutes, but not over. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms Maguire, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate. And as a member of the Social Security Committee, I'd like to thank everyone who took part in our scrutiny of the bill, including my MSP colleagues on the Social Security and other committees. The passing of this child poverty bill will make clear the commitment of um, the government and of our parliament to eradicating child poverty. It will provide an overarching national aspiration and focus diverse minds, organisations and approaches on a clear shared goal. For these reasons, I fully support the bill and I thank the government for introducing it. As we've heard, the bill sets out four ambitious headline statutory income targets supplemented by robust interim targets. These targets are accompanied by stringent reporting requirements at both national and lo local level. And all of the above will be underpinned by a statutory poverty and inequality commission. In conjunction with the many other measures being taken by the government, this bill will play a central role in tackling child poverty, galvanizing and focusing action on clear income-based targets to be met by April 2030. If Parliament supports the bill this evening, which I hope it will, then we can take rightful pride in the huge step forward that it represents. But as we celebrate Scotland's step forward, it's important to also reflect on the fact that the actions of the UK Tory government are pulling us backwards at the same time. I appreciate that this is not comfortable listening for uh, Scottish Conservative colleagues, but I'm afraid that it's the reality of the context in which we're working to tackle child poverty in Scotland. The Child Poverty Action Group report published earlier this week, which sets out how cuts to universal credit will push one more, one million more children into poverty by 2020, is merely the latest addition to the damning dossier of evidence of the harm being done by Tory welfare reform. And we should also remember that the very reason we're debating this bill today is because the UK Tory government took the disgraceful decision to scrap its own child poverty targets. And I think people will come to their own conclusions about how much of a priority tackling child poverty is for the UK Tories. By contrast, here in this parliament, we're doing what we can to mitigate and to be proactive. But there are limitations to what you can achieve with so much resource being invested in mitigating. And it can feel... Yes, I will. Neil Finlay. I agree with um, much of what the member said in relation to the conduct of the Conservative Party, but um, does she agree with me that we cannot address child poverty when we cut local government budgets year on year on year? Because that is part of the front line against ch uh, in the fight against poverty and inequality. I Ruth Maguire. Thank you. Uh, I thank Neil Finlay for that intervention and I agree that local authorities play a huge role in tackling child poverty and we heard lots of examples through the committee and yes, funding has to be appropriate to local authorities. Um, in terms of the resource that we are mitigating, um, using to mitigate Tory welfare, it can feel like we're being dragged backwards um, while we're trying to press forwards or running to stand still. And we have to be really clear, presiding officer, by pressing ahead with the rollout of universal credit, the UK Tory government is actively choosing to push more children into poverty. Our current starting point is one in four children living in poverty, and that's challenging enough. But under the policies of the Tories, that figure will have increased before this bill even hits the statute book. Now, I welcome wholeheartedly the contribution and the support made by Tory MSPs for this bill but they have to know that it's not enough just to support policies to tackle child poverty. You also have to oppose those that increase it. And I would urge them to stand up for Scotland's children by joining the rest of this parliament and using whatever influence they might have with their UK colleagues to call for an immediate halt to the rollout of universal credit. In conclusion, presiding officer, as Scotland's parliament, we've got a pressing duty to do all we can to protect and support children growing up in Scotland today. We've also got a duty to future generations of children to ensure that the actions we take now mean that they're born into a fairer and more prosperous society. And we've got a wider duty to send a clear message that child poverty, wherever it exists, is unacceptable, that it contravenes a child's fundamental human rights and that it cannot and must not be tolerated. Today, in passing this bill, we will, as a parliament, take a crucial step forward in meeting that duty to our children giving all children in Scotland an equal chance to succeed and thrive. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I am a present a member of the uh, 
Social Security Committee, but was not involved in this. And I want to pay credit to all those that were on the committee who have taken uh, this bill and I think made it a lot better bill uh, than it started off. And I think it does show the strength of the Parliament that both at stage one and stage two and today, we have seen uh, colleagues from across different parties uh, coming together uh, to get the best results for the whole of Scotland. And I think it can give us um, assurance and hope um, as we go forward in regard to the Social Security Bill, uh, stage one and stage two in due course, that we can have consensus. There is clearly, clearly agreement amongst all parties that any child in poverty today is wrong. And I think what this bill helps us to do and helps us refocus both the Scottish Government and us as a Parliament is that to tackle this and to meet the targets, the ambitious targets of 2030, is that we do need to work together. It can't be done by one commission or one government or just a number of individuals. We need Scottish Government working together with local authorities. And I agree uh, with Neil Finlay's uh, question that he made a few moments ago. We need to see local authorities delivering on this uh, and making sure that they have an important role to play. Local authorities need to... Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. Would Jeremy Balfour also agree that uh, the reserved UK government also has a role to play, for example, by halting the disastrous rollout of universal credit? Jeremy Balfour. I, I totally agree that the UK government has a role to play. I don't accept his final remark that uni universal credit is the disaster that he is painting it as. Uh, and clearly we, uh, as a, a group here in Scotland, as a party here in Scotland, um, have made our views very clear and we will continue to make those clear in regard to taking this issue forward, uh, both here in Scotland and across the United Kingdom. But local authorities must also work with the third sector as well. Uh, I think the third sector has a, a growing role to play in this. Often they are the ones on the ground delivering local services and knowing the local people within that community. And so I hope collectively we can see everybody working together in regard to this. Can I particularly uh, welcome the uh, independence now of, of this commission? And I think it will be an organisation that can not just report to Scottish Government, but can report to this Parliament as well. And I think it can be a, a, a friend, a, a helpful friend to us uh, and to the government and can help us see if we are moving in the right direction and if we are moving at the right speed. My only slight one concern in regard to this so far is that we have spent, and, and I think rightly so, but we have spent a lot of time focusing ourselves on targets. And clearly, if you aim at nothing, you hit nothing. And we do need to have targets. But targets in themselves do not automatically produce positive outcomes. And I think we need to keep very focused in regard to the outcomes that we are looking to achieve. I, I agree with uh, my uh, colleague in his opening remarks. Yes, one of the key factors is in regard to finance and income and money. But we must also look at other reasons that people are held back in poverty, whether it's in regard to education, housing, in regard to other things that we have responsibility for within this parliament. And we must remain focused on tackling these inequalities as well as the income issue as well. Clearly, as a parliament, as a Scottish government, we have limited amount of finances that we can spend on any area. And I do, in conclusion, think we need to focus our spending in the right direction. Can I say, if we are really generally going to look at things like child poverty, spending money on things like baby boxes simply does not produce what we want. Can I also suggest, of all, um, I, I attended some of the same briefings as Alison Johnson, I, I cannot see spending five more pounds in regard to jail benefit as the particularly appropriate way, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't The member's it. closing has got I, 10 I, seconds. I don't see it as the right way, as only 25% of people who are in poverty would actually benefit from that, while 75% who are not in poverty would benefit as well. 
With that, I conclude presenting. Thank please. you very much. I call Alec Neil to be followed by Ian Gray. Mr. Neil, please. Indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I begin by congratulating the Cabinet Secretary and all our opposition spokespeople counterparts for the very productive and amiable way in which this bill has been handled. Can I say that uh, setting targets is important and this bill is an important platform on which to build our child poverty and an effective child poverty strategy. The key challenge for us now is how are we going to make it happen uh, to ensure that we achieve these targets by 2030 and the interim targets between now and then. And the first point I would want to make is I agree with Adam Tompkins that this is not just about cash income into poor families. Uh, assistance in educational attainment, assistance in employment, assistance with housing, and a whole range of other areas all form part and parcel of a child poverty a strategy. But the reality is that given the current situation where we are, if we do not start to inject substantial cash into the pockets of families with, uh, who are living in poverty uh, who have children, then we will not solve the poverty problem. In other words, I'm not saying that cash into their pockets is all the answer, but it is a prerequisite to achieving these targets. Uh, and I believe that the government, and despite the very difficult financial situation facing it, should look at trying to make a start in this year's budget for next year. And I've got two suggestions to make. We quite rightly, I think more or less across the chamber, have been very annoyed and angered by the fact that children, the third child of people living in poverty, are no longer entitled to child tax credit. I think as a matter of urgency, the government should look at whether they can plug that gap. It will not cost a lot of money because it only applies to those children living in families who qualify for child tax credit and it only applies to those children who are third or uh, later uh, in uh, the family born on or after April 2017. But it would let us rectify what is a moral outrage, let alone something that is uh, making child poverty worse. My second suggestion, and there is a big debate to be had, about whether we target more through child tax credit increases, topping them up from within this uh, parliament, or whether we go for universal benefits. The reality of the immediate financial situation facing us is that if we have a spare 150 or 300 million pounds to dedicate to child poverty, and I would hope that figures of that kind of sum are being talked about and planned for over the next couple of years on an annual basis. But for example, according to SPICE, if we talked up every child's tax credit who's currently receiving child tax credit, just under half a million children in Scotland, it would cost 150 million pounds a year to give them an extra fiver a week on top of the child tax credit they get today. Uh, if we have a spare 300, I would rather give those kids 10 pounds a week than apply the increase in child benefit for the simple reason that eradicating child poverty, reducing child poverty is the number one priority. And we don't have the powers to deal with the taxing as the way we would want to uh, of those people who are much better off who don't need the universal benefit. Yeah. Adam Tompkin. Grateful to Mr. Neil for taking an intervention. What does Mr. Neil say to the finding of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation that um, tackling poverty by increasing the value of benefits without addressing the underlying drivers of poverty has failed, not my words, but the words of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, that that strategy of tackling poverty has failed to tackle poverty in the United Kingdom. Alec Neil, well, I'm afraid well, you'll have to yeah, do well this that, briefly. That's precisely the point I made earlier. You've got to tackle both. You've got to do all the other things, the underlying uh, issues, such as 70% of uh, children in poverty are living in households where someone is in work. 
the reason they're in poverty is probably because they're not getting the living wage. So you have to tackle that the same way the 30% referred to by Mr. Tompkins. So uh, there has to be an overall strategy. The point I am making, if the strategy does not include putting additional cash resources into the families where children are living in poverty, the overall strategy will fail. That has to be part of the jigsaw, part of the plan, part of the strategy, uh, on top of all the other things that are happening. If we do not tackle this at its root and they put a cash injection in, then many of our other objectives in terms of reducing health inequalities, educational attainment gap and all the rest of it will not succeed. I therefore hope that the next step will be addressed very quickly and comprehensively. Thank you. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Gray, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I started this week um, uh, doing something that all of us do, which was meeting one of the schools uh, who had come in to visit the Parliament and answering their questions. And uh, they asked me a question that they almost always do, which is, uh, why did you want to be an MSP? And, and the answer I give to that question uh, is for the same reason that uh, every MSP I've known in all my time in politics from any party, and that's because I believe this country can be better, uh, and I think I know uh, what we have to do in order to do that. And in all sincerity, that is what uh, all of us look to do. And if that's the case, then uh, surely there is no greater improvement that we should and can seek than the eradication uh, of what Polly McNeil called a scandal, quite rightly, that we still have uh, so many 260,000 children's lives uh, blighted by poverty, their life chances constrained uh, by uh, that, uh, 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 that uh, scourge. But I also say uh, to those uh, children, uh, although that's why we're all here, uh, we differ and sometimes differ uh, very uh, uh, significantly uh, on what has to be done uh, to make the improvements that we all want to see. And the origins uh, of uh, this legislation today do lie in that because they go back, of course, to the income inequality targets, the target to eradicate child poverty set by a Labour government way back in 1999 and legislated for two, uh, in 2010. Uh, and the changes which came about with the change of administration in the UK government in 2010 uh, and the repeal of those income inequality targets. So a different view of the approach which should be taken to eradicating child poverty. And it was, I, I think I'm right in saying that the Scottish Government disagreed uh, with the repeal of those targets, which really led to the legislation uh, before us today, a, a disagreement uh, in which, in my view, uh, they were absolutely right. Notwithstanding, I think, the very creditable uh, approach that's been taken by the Conservatives here uh, in this Parliament. So it is, uh, legislation born by an agreement in our purpose, but some disagreement in the past uh, and how we take it forward. Uh, it's also, uh, I think, very much what this parliament itself is for when we wish to take a different view and a different approach here in Scotland to the rest of the United Kingdom. The parliament empowers us to do that, and that is what we are doing today in order to protect the vulnerable, the vulnerable, those vulnerable children. And it... it, it, it it is the times like this the Parliament was made for because we know in the past year the number of children in Scotland living in poverty has increased by 40,000. So if there is any time to act, uh, this is the right time. Uh, and so today uh, we commit ourselves to reverse that trend and to move instead towards a position uh, where, child, where child poverty is eradicated. Uh, but the legislative road uh, to hell, of course, is paved with good intentions, and uh, we can all think of examples, uh, a statutory right to a particular waiting time guarantee, for example, where we have legislated, but then failed uh, to deliver on the promises that legislation holds. So Alec Neil is absolutely right that what is key is our willingness to actually do what is required in order to move towards uh, and reach those targets. I, just finished the other day the, the most recent biography of Clement Attlee, and there was much in there 
uh, about the 1945 Labour government, which is also uh, uh, something which uh, today's work uh, here in this parliament has a direct link to, uh, as they implemented the beverage report, the attempt to defeat beverages giants on the, that stood in the way of progress, uh, want, disease, ignorance, squalor, uh, and idleness. And it is to our shame that to a degree these, these giants still uh, roam our country today. But that government legislated the means to actually change that. The legislation they put through was the Family Allowance Act, the National Insurance Act, the Pensions Act, and of course the NHS. So as we commit today to uh, this noble end of eradicating child poverty by 2030, we must do so in the sure and certain knowledge that we will have to take difficult and challenging decisions on areas such as tax and benefits and public services, because the measure of the sincerity of our commitment will be that willingness to will the means in order to achieve this end. Thank you very much. I call Alison Johnson to follow by Alec Cole Hamilton. Ms Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to begin, too, by, by thanking those I didn't previously, the legislative team, the clerks, my MSP colleagues, um, the small team in my own office. I'd also like to mention, as others have, One Parent Family Scotland, our own youth parliament, and Oxfam. Today is a really important day for the Scottish Parliament. By putting targets for child poverty reduction back into law, we're saying that child poverty in a country as well off as our own isn't acceptable and that this parliament will expend every effort to significantly reduce it as we work to eradicate it. The latest statistics, as we've heard, show just what a huge challenge there is. this is. There has been a 4% rise in relative child poverty in just one year between 2014-15 and 15-16. That is a rise of 40,000 children, 260,000 children. That's more than a quarter of a million children in this country living in poverty. Peter Townsend, who was one of Britain's leading experts on poverty and one of the founders of the Child Poverty Action Group, defined relative poverty as having an income so seriously below those commanded by the average individual or family that they are, in effect, excluded from ordinary living patterns, customs and activities. No swimming lessons, no trips to the cinema, no friends round to play after school. Five pounds may not be a lot of money to Jeremy Balfour, but to many families, this means that their children can't join in. And I will not take lessons on this issue from Ms. I will not take an intervention at this point, Mr. Balfour, and I won't take lessons from someone, from Mr. Balfour, who supports the random discrimination of the two-child limit and the abominable rape clause. In setting this challenge of significantly reducing child poverty, we must rise to it urgently. This Parliament and the Scottish Government needs to have the clearest, the boldest strategy on combating the ill effects of so-called welfare reform and boosting the incomes of our poorest families. Last week, the Institute for Fiscal Studies projected another rise in relative child poverty in Scotland by 2020-21. It projects that it could reach 29%, 300,000 children affected by then. And it says that a third of the rise in relative poverty will be directly as a result of tax and benefit changes, surely shameful. The IFS predicts that the two child limit on child tax credits alone will lead to a 2% rise in relative child poverty across the UK. In the face of these cuts, we will need to significantly raise the incomes of our poorest families. The Scottish Government's more generous Best Start grant is a good beginning and I welcome that, but we need to go further. Investment in income maximisation services, which help folk access the benefits they're entitled to, can help families increase their incomes by thousands of pounds. We've seen evidence of this, and I welcome the government's accepting my amendment at stage two. I think it's important that the bill's delivery plans and local child poverty action reports will refer to this income maximisation. And as I mentioned when I moved the amendment on child benefit top-ups, we are, I think, going to have to look at using the powers to top-up benefits and perhaps also to create new ones. Now, I appreciate there are very different views across the Chamber on how that might be achieved, but it's a good start to have a requirement to consider topping up on the face of the bill in order to start that debate, and I thank the Chamber for agreeing to my amendment. And while I accept that the Scottish Government is already 
spending a significant amount of money attempting to mitigate welfare cuts. And, you know, as someone who supported devolution before I joined the Green Party, I appreciate too how frustrating it can be that we can't be more proactive and are constantly reacting. But there is still more that can be done and we must do with the powers that this Parliament will have. Green research has shown that the new benefit cap is removing thousands of pounds a year from the homes of some 11,000 children in Scotland. Improvements have been made to this bill from members and parties across the chamber. The bill, I think, is widely recognised to be significantly improved compared to how it began. Adam Tompkins put significant effort into placing the Poverty and Inequality Commission on a statutory footing, and to its credit, the Scottish Government have accepted that, as indeed it has accepted a number of opposition amendments from Greens, from Pauline McNeill and Jackie Bailey of Labour, all of which have made this a more robust bill. Parties have worked together well to improve this, and I hope we continue that approach with the Social Security Bill. In closing, presiding officer, the targets in the bill represent a major challenge, one to which we must rise. We should be ashamed that in this wealthy country, many of our children live well below the accepted, the average accepted standard. We must break this cycle. Passing this bill is only the beginning. The delivery plans will need to have policies more radical, far-reaching and better funded than we'd ever had before. And I can pledge that the Greens will play their role in that ongoing process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alec Cole-Hamilton to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Cole-Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by declaring an interest that I have served as the past convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights and having worked in and alongside charities and groups campaigning to end child poverty all of my adult life. I'm pleased that so many of them were afforded the opportunity to influence this bill. And if I may say, start by saying that lobbyists don't always have a good name, but I would like to recognise the continuing efforts of some in particular, uh, particularly Peter Kelly and Carla McCormack of the Poverty Alliance, John Dickey and Jenny Duncan of the Child Poverty Alliance, and my good friend Chloe Riddle uh, from Children First, all of whom are first-rate champions in this area. It was my privilege to serve alongside them for nearly 15 years, and I'm delighted that they were given the chance to impart their expertise throughout the passage of the bill. I think they have added considerably to it, and I am proud to lead uh, for my party on this bill today. I'd like to also thank the Scottish Government in particular for their inclusive approach. I think Parliament works best when the Government opens its doors to people of all parties. And I welcome particularly the amendments around the Statutory Commission, on which I know this Government has moved a considerable distance. I certainly thank them for that. Naturally, this bill commands the support of these benches, and I am heartily glad that this view is shared across this Parliament today. There is now a recognition in this chamber that our efforts to tackle the scourge of child poverty must go far beyond just the financial health of our nation's families. I speak to the range of other poverties which are in many ways as pressing as financial poverty and that may have as profound an impact on life outcomes. That is a poverty of aspiration, children growing up in families that have experienced generations of unemployment and economic inactivity, then to not seek social mobility for themselves. Poverty of attachment, particularly among the 15,000 children in our care system who will find it difficult to form lasting adult relationships due to tr childhood trauma and loss. Poverty of health, where poor housing, health inequalities and depression diminish both life outcomes and expectancy. As such, we need, as a parliament, a whole systems response to child poverty going forward. So, while the introduction of targets that we will pass this afternoon throws our metaphorical cap over the wall, it will be in the delivery of the progress against these targets that we shall all of us be judged. Put simply, presiding officer, this bill sets us the destination. It is now up to us to determine the means of travel and to put passage upon it. And delivery plans linked to physical and mental health are a fantastic start. And I welcome the introduction of local child poverty action reports. But these two need to be bookended by proactive efforts on the parts of our local authorities to plan ahead through community planning and children's services planning processes. I am pleased and I also wel welcome the amendments which seek to boost equalities provision, especially in those areas of child poverty which are particular to protected characteristics. I agree with the need to put those on the face of the bill because experience shows us that existing impact assessments just don't always cut it despite 
the good intentions behind them. And I'm very grateful to Adam Tompkins for his efforts to flush out a statutory definition around educational attainment. I agree that is entirely necessary, but would suggest that when this is forthcoming, and I look forward to working with the government to that end, that we need to look beyond just the inclusion of Scottish multiple indices and multiple deprivation areas alone, but we must also include things like Scotland's young people who are looked after or who have care experience, for whom education outcomes are some of the worst in this country. Deputy Presiding Officer, experiencing poverty is an adverse childhood experience that can have lifelong effects. We, as such, must link poverty reduction with high quality trauma recovery and family support. Because without so doing, we won't stop cycles of intergenerational trauma and we will see our successors in this chamber still having to debate this issue decades from now. Today is an example of this parliament working at its best. Those people who sent us here would rather we had more days like it where we chart a course to this common purpose without acrimony, but with steely intent. And I assure the government of our support in the passage of this bill tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White, to be followed by Jamie Green. Ms White, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Can I let others before me thank the clerks of the Social Security Committee for all the work that they have carried out, also the stakeholders and groups who have uh, taken the time to write, give evidence, and indeed, I think in part helped to shape this bill to, to what it's come today at the stage, stage three. Uh, just to, to, to let others know who weren't on the committee, when the committee first looked at this bill, it was sort of a looked at and suggested that the title could possibly be changed to Child Poverty Target Bill, because it seemed to just be generated on targets. But uh, further meetings and evidence showed that the bill could and, and basically should be much more than just targets. Uh, but I also want to say that, which indeed we know are very important, in fact, with the passing of this bill, Scotland will be the only part of the UK with statutory income targets uh, on child poverty, and it is important. But we have seen previous speakers mention the fact that poverty comes in many guises, such as housing and education and others as well. So that's why we wanted to look at it, uh, you know, in, in a much broader vein in that. And I do want to thank the committee members and the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government as well for the work they carried out together to look at that and recognise that it wasn't just about targets. Very important, but poverty does come in other ways. And I do want to mention two particular areas which I think uh, stand out. The working between the committee, uh, the MSPs and the Scottish Government also, particularly the Poverty and Inequality Commission. Now this it came up in the committee, stage one, stage two, and obviously it's stage three as well. And I do commend uh, you know, the committee members and obviously the cabinet secretary as well for the work that was done on that. I mean, it was really important that we recognise that we couldn't have such a, you know, a small, narrow, just child poverty. It had to be bigger than that. And I, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. And if I could um, just a quote from the letter which the Cab Secretary had sent to the committee, which I think we got about five minutes before the debate started from, from the, uh, the Clarks. It basically, it mentions the fact that the order is a practical and pragmatic way of delivering a statutory poverty and inequality commission with a wide-ranging remit. And I think that's really important. It'll improve the exercise of public functions, having regard to efficiency, effectiveness and economy by allowing a single statutory body to provide the wide range of independent advice on poverty and inequality that the Parliament and obviously stakeholders clearly support. And I think others have mentioned the fact of working together. It's with, you know, the, the Parliament working together and the government working together. We've came to stage three at this particular point. Might not have been easy during stage one and stage two, but we got to that point. And I do congratulate everyone for, for, for that. It's really important. Child poverty is such an, an important issue. And for us to be able to bring forward, you know, a, a child poverty bill and deliver that is absolutely fantastic. And that's what brings me on to my next one, which I think is really important. And other uh, contributors and members have mentioned as well is the delivery plans. They are really, really important. And I think we should rec remember and recognise that the delivery plan is to be published at points during the life of the legislation. 
and the first delivery plan is due in 2018. Now, that's not that far away. So we'll see how that has went along the road and we'll be able to hold uh, the government to account in regards to that as well. And as a baseline, progress can actually be measured. And it's not something that's pie in the sky. It's something that's real. It's something that is real for the people out there, the children who are living in poverty. And I must say, I'm pleased that we're all working together on this, but there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever with the changes to universal credit and the benefit system, more and more children are living in adverse poverty. And, you know, you can't forgive them for that. And I know that Ruth Maguire and others, Alison Johnson, have mentioned this fact, but if anybody could speak, anybody at all could speak to the Westminster government, I don't know how that would go just now, uh, perhaps from the other benches there, because universal credit has been proven. It's driving more and more people into poverty. And I don't want to cite various uh, issues there or, or various constituency cases or whatever, but people are dying because they have no money whatsoever, not just to pay their rent, but to feed themselves and heat, heat. not just themselves, but their children as well. So that's a, a huge issue as well. And I would be really grateful if we would realise it's not just, you know, us being able to make something different for children in poverty, but it is also a Westminster issue as well, and we can't get away from that. I think I'll, I'll finish on this particular point. I think we all would remember uh, the Billy Connolly, the act of Billy Connolly, where he said that uh, they're hiding in their beds and the mum says someone comes to the door. And they say, could you pull that duvet over? And they say, oh yes, the duvet is actually old, old army coats. Some kids are still having to live like that pretending they've got blankets and it's all coats covering the bed to heat them up. We can't do that to our kids in Scotland or anywhere else, actually. But at least we can make a start with this. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Ben McPherson. And Mr Green is the penultimate speaker in the open debate. Mr Green, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to participate in the debate today. Uh, members may recall that I spoke in our previous debate in this in some detail. Uh, it was probably one of the more difficult speeches I've had to deliver in the Parliament, as the subject had a very striking personal resonance to me. But this debate is much bigger than me, it's much bigger than any MSP in here today, and it's much bigger than any of the words spoken in this debate. So I approached today, today's debate in the same tone as before, and with the same earnest expectation that when Parliament works together on legislation such as this, it produces meaningful output. There is absolutely nothing headline grabbing in what I have to say today. Child poverty, as indeed poverty more generally, is a serious issue uh, which needs tackling in Scotland and indeed throughout the UK. And it cannot be disputed by anyone in this chamber that it will require all of our commitment to do so. Moreover now, as the Scottish Parliament is listed in this bill as a consultee in the creation of the delivery plan, and will also review the progress reports as laid uh, before us by the Minister. There is an increased duty on us to engage in the plan and monitor its relative success or otherwise. Uh, the importance of this bill has been summed up, I think, nicely in the words of Alison Todd, uh, Chief Executive of Children First, who said, and I quote, by creating a framework to hold this and future governments to account for their efforts to eradicate child poverty, this bill marks a crucial milestone in achieving that vision, end quote. And I couldn't agree more. Now, the issues that I raised in the stage one debate centered around the following issues. First of all, tackling poverty through education and closing the attainment gap. The lack of a delivery plan at the time beyond measuring and the setting of targets and uh, a lack of a more grassroots research approach into uh, generational poverty and the importance uh, of household worklessness in this issue. Now, at previous stages of the bill's progression, uh, we have been encouraged by the government's willingness to make amendments, and as a result of this, the bill we are discussing uh, today is far more robust than it was beforehand, and that is to be welcomed. On the plus side, we welcome specifically the addition of interim targets set out on a statutory footing rather than secondary legislation, and indeed the establishment of an independent statutory commission, which will help us hold the government of the day to account. But my colleague Adam Tompkins mentioned uh, and that in these benches would also have gone further around employment targets, robust plans and targets to reduce the number of workless households in Scotland, in my view, would go a long way to reduce poverty in said households. 
Now, I don't need to go into great detail, but I have first-hand experience of the direct link be uh, between uh, unemployment in the home and poverty. And it has been and remains my view that employment can be the most impactful step out of poverty. I would voice my concerns uh, around those that the atmosphere of setting targets, uh, and, and I add that concern in the hope that whilst targets are indeed meaningful, we do not fall into a mindset that the setting of targets is a means to an end, uh, not an end in itself. Now, I see the success of this bill uh, in being that we take very tangible steps to tackle, reduce, and eradicate poverty, and that the focus is not simply on meeting targets, but as we review uh, the interim progress reports, let's be honest with ourselves if targets are not met. Why were they not met, and what will change? The point I'd like to take away from today's debate is that the focus cannot solely be on income either. Albeit an important metric, it does not take into account things like the quality of housing, parity of healthcare provision, educational attainment, and skills and access to the workplace, things that these benches have highlighted. Presiding officer, this bill is a prime example, in my view, of the impact that Hollywood can have when it actively seeks to find consensus and works in a cooperative manner to tackle some of the deep-rooted issues that I think transcend political cycles and partisan disagreements. In my stage one debate, I used the following words. I do not think that one party or another holds a magic wand that will eradicate child poverty. Good ideas will come from all sides. Now, I believe that those ideas have led to where we are today, but let us not pat ourselves too readily on the back at decision time this evening. What is said and passed in Holyrood today must be delivered on the streets of Scotland tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ben McPherson, the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McPherson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. It's a great privilege to speak in this debate, in this part of stage three debate on this very important piece of legislation. I would also like to thank colleagues uh, the so in the Social Security Committee and all the third sector organisations and other organisations who contributed to all of us making a, a an important piece of legislation before us today are, and the constructive manner in which the government engaged with us all and to all the clerks who assisted us. And I share others' opinions that the process of this bill has showed this parliament at its best and what can be achieved by working together on what the cabinet secretary rightly said is the, the road to eradicating child poverty and, and poverty in itself as well. For me, uh, as a constituency MSP in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith, there is instances of child poverty in my constituency that would be unacceptable to all as it is unacceptable in any other part of Scotland. Um, for example, this summer the Spartans Community Football Association raised money to, to tackle holiday hunger. Nationally, statistics have already been quoted that we have the fact that almost one in four children in Scotland are officially recognised as living in poverty and that uh, according to the IFS this is uh, predicted to increase. Just this week the, the Trussell Trust also uh, published figures that the use of food banks in Scotland has risen by 20% in the last year. So the, the, the challenge before us from where we start by passing this legislation is, is hugely pertinent, upsetting and, and uh, a challenge for us all. And this is frustrating in a, in, a, in a position where such child poverty is so unnecessary. The Scottish, Scotland is an incredibly advanced country, a strong economy. The UK has the ninth biggest economy in the world. And we must ask ourselves, you know, what, how can this be the case? And it's, it's the, com the complexity that's already taken place in today's debate around the, the, the causal factors of, of child poverty and poverty more, more widely. Uh, transcend beyond the powers of, of this parliament into reserved matters and I'm, I'm glad that the, the, the Conservatives acknowledge that point that we need good policy uh, from the other parliament that, that governs Scotland um, and across the, the, the spectrum because you know for example we heard this week during Living Wage Week that uh, only one in five Scots uh, earn uh, the so, sorry one in five Scots earn less than the real living wage and um, there's been uh, published figures from the Resolution Foundation this year around inequality of wealth and of course 
the, the damage of, of, of welfare reform and the problems around the role of universal credit have been clear for all to see. So all of that creates a, a huge challenge. And, and while some are to blame, all are responsible and uh, some are more to blame, but all are responsible. And I think the holistic approach that's been taken in this debate and also uh, in, is taken in this bill around the, the, the targets, the interim targets, the, the cross-party effort, the emphasis on the delivery plan and the emphasis on a cross-government approach and, and a willingness from these benches, I hope, to, to press the UK government matters on matters too, gives us all an opportunity to, to let the start of something happen today. A real clear statement, not just in terms of, of passing a law, but a commitment, and there seems to be commitment from all sides, to really galvanise and focus on addressing the issue of child poverty. And I thought Ian Gray spoke very powerfully about how people, when he has goes to speak to school groups, they ask him, you know, what is the, your number one aim for, for, for going into to politics? And it's to help other people. And tackling child poverty couldn't be a more clear and important aspect of that. And I also think when we speak to young people as politicians in this era, it's clear to me that those young people have been through a decade of austerity where the idea of overcoming child poverty and tackling poverty per se has perhaps been abstract, if not uh, unobtainable. And I worry about the normalization of poverty in our society, particularly with the welfare reform agenda from the Westminster government and some of the other challenges. And I think what today gives us the ability to do, if we do have that cross-party support, is not only pass a meaningful law in terms of the delivery plans and the, the, the robust targets within it and all the other aspects of the legislation, but to start a process of regalvanizing ourselves as a nation with hope and determination and optimism that we can tackle child poverty and we can do so meaningfully and we can tackle it robustly. And I hope that we take that leadership on today and roll it out across the years ahead and deliver the targets within this piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Closing speeches, I call on Mark Griffin to close for Labour. Mr Griffin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating the Cabinet Secretary and her officials, uh, members of the Social Security Committee and uh, the clerks and all of the outside organisations um, who've put in so much to, to shape uh, the legislation from uh, the bill that was introduced to the one that we have um, in front of us that we'll, we will vote on. Like Jeremy Balfour, um, I come to this child poverty bill um, late in the day and I'd like to particularly thank uh, Richard Leonard for taking my place on the Social Security Committee, which allowed me time to spend uh, with my wife and our daughter at a critical time for us, so thank you, uh, Richard. We welcome the Child Poverty Bill as an opportunity to create a cross-government strategy that tackles the roots of, of child poverty. I think this is the first really meaningful cross-portfolio action uh, the government has taken to challenge poverty and it's long overdue in, in this parliament. But we think that the, the bill must be followed by bold and effective policy making in some of the ways that Alex Neil mentioned in his um, contribution. And, and crucially, uh, that it must be followed up by use of the Scottish Parliament's new social security powers. Targets will not in themselves reduce child poverty. And the figures around child poverty um, are stark. They've been quoted by a number of speakers in the debate, but I think it's important to restate that there are 260,000 children living in poverty in Scotland, an increase of 40,000 in just one year. As the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, 70% of children um, in poverty are in, are in working families. Um, and Pauline McNeill pointed out that children from more deprived backgrounds lag two years behind wealthier ones at school. And a, a toddler in a poor household is two and a half times more likely than a toddler from a more affluent household to suffer from a chronic illness. And we've shown uh, in government, as Alison Johnson uh, mentioned during the debate on the amendments, that uh, despite the challenges, things can be done differently. The last Labour government lifted 120,000 kids 
out of poverty in Scotland. And our approach to this legislation has been consistent through the whole process. Um, as a result, there have been amendments to include the Poverty and Inequality Commission in this bill and that the government has agreed that the commission should be put on a statutory footing. It was and I think is essential that the, the group tasked with advising and holding the government to account is independent and that its future is assured. We, along with others, have also put pressure on the government to use the Parliament's new social security powers through amendments that, that force the government to lay out why any de delivery plan does or does not include using the powers at their disposal to top up benefits. For example, the, the government should have to set out why they are or are not topping up child benefit, knowing that a five pound a week top up could lift 30,000 children out of poverty. We've asked the, the government to consider the unique challenges, including financial challenges that are faced by single parents, by families that include a disabled person, and by families that include someone with a protected characteristic and reflect these in the delivery plan. We've ensured that interim targets appear on the face of the bill and delivery plans are linked directly to bringing down child poverty. Any plan must include an assessment of the contribution the proposed measures would make to the targets and how that has been arrived at. And we've ensured that when progress towards the targets is not made, that the plans are scrutinised and altered if appropriate. Presiding officer, as they say, the proof of the pudding will be in the, the eating and the passing of this legislation in itself will not lift a single child out of poverty. The proof of the pudding will be in the delivery plans the government put in place and the funds that are allocated in the budget to tackling child poverty. We welcome this legislation as the first step towards tackling the scourge of child poverty and look forward to the government taking bold and radical policy decisions backed up by substantial resources who make a real difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Griffin. I call on Michelle Ballantyne to close for the Conservatives. Ms. Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I first apologise for my late entry to the Chamber, um, the early start? I'm really pleased to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, because we on these benches have supported the laudable principles of this bill from stage one. We have sought never to supplant its aspirations, but to support and strengthen the prospects of their achievement. This bill is now far stronger than when it was introduced, and I commend all parties and the Scottish Government on their efforts to build cross-chamber consensus to buttress the provisions of this bill. As my colleague Adam Tompkins has highlighted, we particularly welcome the Scottish Government's support for the Conservative amendments to Section 7, in embedding an obligation within the statute book whereupon it is incumbent upon ministers to take steps to address the educational attainment gap, we see a real and important improvement to the bill. We know that edu educational underattainment is one of the key contributory drivers of child poverty. And it was apparent to most in this chamber that the Scottish Government's child poverty strategy, or indeed any child poverty strategy, would not work if it was centered around a myopic focus on income. A wider, jo wider joined up approach is vital. And it is for this reason that I find myself hoping that we haven't missed an opportunity, because a missed opportunity to confer legal requirements upon ministers to reduce the number of children in Scotland who grow up in workless ho households, a missed opportunity to imprint into the statute book a duty for ministers to take steps to mitigate family breakdown, and a missed opportunity to legally compel the Scottish Government to address the manifest impact of alcohol and drug addiction on child poverty Quickly. Polly McNeill. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving me. Um, I wondered why the member was so concerned about workless households when many members have talked about the higher percentage of people who are still in poverty while they're actually in work. Do you not agree that that must be high? It's a higher priority. Michelle Ballantyne. Um, fundamentally, because 30% of children in poverty are in workless households, uh, and it is about a, a continuation, yeah. continuation of a problem. Um, and about aspiration that was referred to by other members. Presiding officer, if we in this place are truly serious about ta tackling child poverty in Scotland, 
We need to think about these underlying issues as part of a complete and holistic approach to meeting the targets set out in this bill. And I, I do in this respect fear that at times we may fall short of the mark. Ian Gray particularly highlighted that the existence of this Scottish Parliament enables us to act in a way that is right for Scotland. And that is the principle on which we have come together to talk about this bill. Um, and it was Alex Neil that said, it is actually the key to this bill is how we take it forward. Um, and I was really pleased that he did acknowledge that it isn't income alone um, that will actually take us forward. He did make two interesting suggestions, but I will leave that to the Cabinet Secretary to respond to. <laughs> Alison Johnson um, made some very nice statements across the chamber about all the contributions that were made by the members, and again highlighted that is that working together that actually underpins the discussions that have gone through this bill. And I would say that Alex Cole Hamilton really, in my view, hit the right notes when he talked about the other impacts of poverty. The poverty of attachment particularly is something I have seen through my professional life. And the poverty of aspiration is something I can certainly acknowledge needs to be addressed. But he did highlight the importance of community planning and the need to ensure that looked after and accommodated children have a voice in this process. Quickly, yeah. Ruth McGuire. Take an intervention, just really briefly. Do you, can you understand how offensive the term poverty of aspiration is to people who simply don't have enough money? Michelle Valentine. Yes, actually I can, because I have worked with a lot of children who've been in that position. And one thing I've always understood and always tried to ensure that the children I have worked with know that actually Money is, is, is part of the process, but believing in yourself, having the confidence and the belief that you can move forward is really important, and there are a number of ways that can be done. In closing, presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting this bill. Notwithstanding some disagreements of process and approach, this bill encapsulates the importance and impact of parliamentary scrutiny. Thanks to effective opposition, not only from the Scottish Conservatives, but from other members of this, this chamber as well, we have seen some significant improvements made throughout the legislative, legislative process. In terms of interim targets, a statutory commission and the strengthening of Section 7. The future trajectory of child poverty in Scotland now depends on delivery plans. Will they amount to a tinkering around the edges or will they be tough, robust and proactive in their approach? I sincerely hope the Scottish Government opt for the latter. In any case, we must be prepared to be fluid and flexible in our efforts as we go forward. Because it is a commitment to tackling the drivers of child poverty and not the setting of targets that ultimately will improve the lives of our most vulnerable and impoverished children. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Andrew Constance to wind up the debate for the Government. Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. In approximately 10 minutes' time, uh, we will all stand united as a Parliament, I hope, to unanimously pass the Child Poverty Bill. And I know that the UK government just now uh, don't have their troubles to seek, most of which is of their own making. But I do hope that they will take stock and note that our parliament is united in saying that we won't lie down, we won't walk away, and we won't give up on the challenge of tackling the rising levels of child poverty in this country, and we'll take that challenge head on. And Mr Tompkins uh, very graciously said to me that he wishes the government good luck with this bill. Let me reciprocate. The UK government is not going to be let off the hook while 85% of welfare spend in Scotland is still controlled by the UK government. And I also want to uh, say to Michelle uh, Ballantyne, 30% of poor households may indeed be workless to use your term but as we've heard earlier that that actually means that 70 percent of children in households that are considered poor that their parents or their carers or their guardians are actually working and they are working for their poverty and that has to be a, a damning indictment on our current society but beside officer the child poverty bill is our 
collective statement of intent, our statement of intent to tackle both the causes and consequences of child poverty, as well as recognising the central importance of income or indeed the lack of income. It's our statement of intent as a parliament, not just to tackle, but to end child poverty. But as most members across the chamber have rightly acknowledged, statements of intent are all very well, but it's what you do that counts. And on that note, I want to say that neither I nor this government was under any obligation or indeed a manifesto commitment to introduce this bill, but we choose to do so. And the reasons for choosing to introduce this bill have been echoed across the chamber. We fundamentally oppose the UK government's scrapping of the statutory income targets. I refute the suggestion that this bill was weak on introduction. It was certainly stronger than anything that had existed before at a UK level. And as, as Alec Neil rightly pointed out, we now have a stronger platform to go forward. And the scale of the challenge that we face is profound. The biggest increase in child poverty since the 1960s, I don't know about anybody else in this chamber, but that certainly keeps me awake at night. And the other aspect for supporting this bill, presiding officer, is that it is, at its heart, absolutely the right thing to do. And while we could have said, no, we're not reintroducing the targets that successive UK governments failed to meet, we don't have all the levers, majority of tax and welfare powers remained reserved. But I chose not to do that because like others, and Ian Gray touched upon this, that despite not knowing what the future holds in terms of our economy, in terms of Brexit, the constitutional future for Scotland, I like others in this chamber came into politics to make Scotland a fairer place and I know I have no monopoly on that. And the question that we will ask ourselves today and every day is what can we do today? What can we do now to make a difference? And while I will always contend unsurprisingly that our job to meet these ambitious and challenging targets would undoubtedly be easier with more powers, but I will acknowledge that under any constitutional settlement, this job of eradicating child poverty will always be challenging and it will be never easy. But that does not mean that it is not achievable. And the challenge that we will all face in this parliament is to find ways to do more than just mitigate against austerity and welfare reform and to actually lift children and their families out of poverty. And this is where the delivery plans are absolutely crucial, where they'll have the detail comprehensive detail about comprehensive action rightly covering our economy, our education, the benefits, a system, housing, uh, health. And we no doubt will return uh, to these debates time and time again. And Ben McPherson is absolutely right. What we all have to guard against is the normalisation of poverty because poverty is fundamentally wrong on every level. And I know that as a government, we will have difficult and at times decisions that seem impossible. The Tories will, of course, have to answer for the impact of so-called welfare reform. But in fairness, we will all have difficult questions to answer. And I know that we will all seek to be guided by the evidence of what will work in the current and future context, not least by the work and advice that we will receive from the Independent and Statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission. And needless to say, presiding officer, I'm sure we'll debate and disagree about what the evidence is and is not. But there is an opportunity here to build some consensus and what the right thing to do is and what the evidence tells us. And as a government, we're prepared to have that debate, whether it's a debate around tax or indeed our new social security powers. But what I'm clear about, presiding officer, crystal clear about, that as a government, as a parliament and as a country, we will have to pull together like we have never done before. And what we will have to do and what will have to be evident when we publish our first delivery plan is that to tackle child poverty, it has to be at the very heart of everything we do. And in that regard, absolutely none of us will be let off the hook. Presiding officer, 
Ending child poverty is the biggest challenge we face as a parliament and indeed as a country. And we all have a responsibility and a role to play. Whether government, parliament, council, businesses, third sector, civic Scotland, we will have to work together in new ways. And in a minute or so, we will, I hope, stand united, even for that moment of time, on the journey between now and 2030 to pass the Child Poverty Scotland Act, a historic milestone, I believe, on the next step to confining child poverty to the history books. Presiding officer, the time for talk is now over. It's now time for us to act. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 8723 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 8723. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 8723 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of nine Parliamentary Bureau motions. Uh, could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 8568 and 8724 to 8731 on approval of SSIs? Moved on block. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm now minded uh, to take a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. Could I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move such a motion? Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that we move decision time to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, the first question is, and we'll, we will vote on this. We will actually um, have a division on this. The first question is that motion 8696 in the name of Angela Constance on the Child Poverty Scotland Bill at stage three be agreed. And members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 8696 in the name of Angela Constance is yes 115, no zero, abstentions zero. The motion is therefore agreed unanimously and the Child Poverty Scotland Bill is passed. I propose to ask a single question on the nine Parliamentary Bureau motions. If anyone objects, objects, please say so now. No member has objected. Therefore, the question is that motions 8568 and 8724 to 8731 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Andy Whiteman. We'll just take a few moments, though, for members to change seats.